Hi, this is Mr. Max. I am doing a paper I gave to the grade 11s in September. So this is paper 1. Paper 2 is already done. Um, let me just get right to it. So the first one here, for one mark, you're supposed to work out 7 over 8 plus 3 and 1 quarter. So you grab your calculator and you work it out. You say um, 7 over 8 and then you add when you want to activate the improper uh, the mixed number you have to press shift okay and then you go ahead and input the values at the right place okay so you get 33 over 8 so it's either 33 over 8 or you can go ahead and give me the answer as a decimal or as a mixed number. See, as a mixed number, shift, and then you press again. So, which is 4 and 1 8. Okay. So, this one here. So, the cube root of 125 is 5. That's 8. That's minus 64. Okay. So, you're going to have minus 51 as an answer. Write this number in order of size, starting from the smallest. Now, it's very important that you uh, do change them to decimals if you if you so wish uh, the smallest one is 3 over 4 because that is like 0 0.75 okay and then if you have 17 upon 20 as a decimal 0 0.85 so this one here is 0 0.85 this is 0 0.82 and so on. So the next one after after that is 0 0.8 followed by 82% followed by 0 0.83 and lastly followed by 17 over 20. Okay. Right, question three, work out 13 and two thirds or 45. You just go ahead, multiply. So you are going to say, um, remember I said shift, you bring in the mixed one. So you say 13 and two thirds, and then you multiply that by 45. Okay, you get 615. No? Okay. So my bad. So it's actually and thirteen and two thirds percent. So percent is shift. It's right here. Okay, just punch it in there like that, and then you get six point one five. So six point one five. Good. Um. So we have got one small. Square that we need to shade in order for this to have rotational symmetry of order four. That means you turn it four times, and then it looks like it has not, um, it has, it has not um, been rotated at all. Okay, so let's see. Um, maybe perhaps we can use this color because this is the block that you need to shade. Okay, um, we'll bring out some nice color here maybe this one here get rid of that good all right the color is still that so this is the one that needs to be shaded I'm just gonna leave a little space there so you could see that this was the one that you need to shade for one mark right the next one shade two more small squares so the diagram has two lines of symmetry well one uh let's maybe rather change this to different color so we'll see well if you have to rotate this in any case um i can just go ahead and shade so i'll just use um that perhaps um, you see that you need to shade this block. There's one more block that you need to shade. The next block is down here. And then the diagram will have two lines of symmetry. Okay. 
Good. That does it for for that particular one. Right. The next one it says you must simplify. So you have got five uh, a minus eight a. So that's going to be minus three a. So because remember there is a one there which we don't write. Okay. You can just go ahead and subtract the coefficients and add, and then you're going to get the coefficient of minus 3, and you attach a to it. The interior angle of a regular polygon is 156 degrees. So this is an interior angle. Remember, if, um, if we have um, an interior angle, so let's say, um, let's suppose we have an exterior angle, like so. We have an interior angle like so. Okay. So let's see. Bring that in. Let's make that different color. Okay. Just bear with me. Right. So let's suppose I have something like that. And uh, let's say. They say 156. So the interior angle, the one inside, is 156. The exterior angle plus the interior angle, the exterior angle plus the interior angle of any polygon is equal to 180 degrees. So if I can find the exterior angle, I can go ahead and say 360. Oh, 180, take away 156. Then I get the exterior angle to be 24. So if this is 24, what do I know? That if you divide, because all these exterior angles as you go around, they will add up to 360. And if you divide 24 by 360, or 360 by 24, rather, then you get, because um, you want to find the number of sides of this polygon, the interior angle of a regular polygon is 156, and find the number of sides. Well, you're gonna get um, 360. So I typed in 306. So there's where my little error is coming from. Good. So it has got 15 sides. Of course, there are other formula that you can use um, in order for you to to calculate that. If you're familiar, you can uh, you can say um, something that you know that this formula here, 180 in bracket n minus two, that gives you the sum of the interior angle. And if you divide it by n, that will give you the 156. All right, and you let that equal to 156, and then you can go ahead and solve this equation you will also arrive at the same answer. A triangle has one angle 55 degrees. The other two angles are in the ratio, so 3 to 2. So let's say 180, let's take away uh, 55, right? So we have 180 minus 55. So these two triangles are basically going to share this 125. So if that is the case, um, you are looking for the smallest angle. So the smallest angle will be two parts of five. So five coming from adding these parts here. And then you multiply that by 125 degrees. Okay, so this is going to give you 50 degrees once you do that. The next question, by writing each number correct to one significant figure, so this number here on top is 60 to one significant figure, the 32.5 becomes 30 to one significant figures. Okay, 30, so that cannot make that um, uh, 33. All right, and then you multiply that by 0 0.1. Okay, so once you do that, you'll get an answer of 20. Solve the simultaneous equation. There are many ways you can solve simultaneous equations. 
uh, I'm going to use the method of making the coefficients equal. I'm going to multiply this equation here by 3. So eventually, it's going to be, if you multiply and you get that equation, is going to be 6x minus 3y is equal to 36. And then the other one is 7x plus 3y is equal to 29. So what I'm going to do now, because I have different signs, I'm going to add the two equations to each other. So I'm going to add this equation to that one. So that gives me 13x, that gives me 0, okay? And that's going to be 65. Okay, so eventually x will therefore be 65 divided by 13. x becomes 5. Now you can substitute in any one of these two in order to get the value of y. So if you say 2 times 5 minus y is equal to 10, or to 12, so that's 10 minus y equals to 12, minus y equals to 12, take away 10, which is 2, and Therefore, you have y equals to negative 2. Because remember, there's that value there. Next question. Uh, ABC is a triangle with AC 5 cm, BC 7 cm, user ruler, and compasses only to construct a triangle. So I'm not going to use the software. But I will walk you through. So you take your compass, okay, and then you open a radius of 5 here, so let's suppose you did that, and then let's say the radius from here is 5, okay? Then you take your compass again, and you open another radius of, say, 7, okay? So the place where they meet, you're going to actually now construct your triangle. So you're going to say then, um, you're going to say, so suppose that is the point where they meet, then you're going to join the points like so and like so. And then you have your triangle. Okay, that's one way that you can go ahead and do that one. And then the next question, you will see that I've done it already. It says, use a straight edge and compasses only and construct the perpendicular bisector of AB. In order for you to construct the perpendicular bisector of AB, that's the line that will cut AB exactly in half. All right, and there are many ways that you can do that. So again, you can uh, go ahead, open your compass, maybe just open your compass slightly more than the distance between the two. And so say, for example, you will be drawing an arc like that. Then use that same radius and you put the sharp side at B and then you are going to do the same. All right, so this is a freehand drawing. Please remember, you're not going to do freehand drawing. And once you are now, here you take your your ruler and you join them okay basically this is what you do using your compass and your ruler but again you would see that i have done it here before so the red one here indicates the five centimeters from a the green one indicates the seven centimeters from b and then you connect a c b then you have that triangle and this blue line is the perpendicular bisector that cuts a b in half and also at 90 degrees. So the next part says a point W lies inside the triangle ABC. The point W is closer to A than to B. Points that are closer to A than to B will be on the side of the perpendicular line. And it goes on, it says, um, shade the region in which W lie. So obviously you see that I have already shaded the region there. So it's on that side. Okay, All right. So that uh, whole question is with, um, of course, if you count all the marks together, uh, it's about five marks for that question there. Right. Evaluate one quarter of um, of x raised to the power of zero. So this is nothing but one over four times one because anything raised to the power of zero is one. So this answer here is. 1 over 4. And then you have, when you are dividing, then you will be subtracting the denominators uh, or the numerator, the, the indices, rather. And if you do, you're going to get m raised to the power of 10. 
Question 12, a map has a scale of 1 is to 10,000. The area of the farm on a map is 6 centimeters squared. So you can go ahead, uh, I will say map, and I will say real life. So 1 centimeter is equivalent to 10,000 centimeters, okay? Right. But now since we are dealing with area, you will go ahead and square this. So this becomes then one square centimeter on the map is equal to when you when you square um, perhaps one what one can also do is you see this ten thousand square ten thousand centimeter we can change it to meters by dividing by a hundred. So this is a hundred meters. Okay, so my scale therefore will be now something like this. And if I square, because I'm working with area, one times one square, so this is meter and that's centimeter. So one square or centimeter square is going to be centimeter square, and meter square is going to be a hundred times a hundred, which is ten thousand square meters. Okay, so now my scale is in terms of, of area. Now they say on the farm, area on the farm is 6 centimeters square. So I put it under the 1 square centimeters. And then I'm just supposed to calculate what the answer will be. So you can go ahead and multiply. When you cross multiply, you're going to get that um, X will be 60,000 square meters. Now, another thing that is worth knowing, and you should know this, is that 1 hectare is equal to 10,000 square meter. Therefore, 60,000 square meter, if you divide it by 10,000 square meter, means that this answer here is six hectares. Convert one square centimeters to square millimeter, All right? Remember one square centimeter is nothing but one centimeter times one centimeter. That's what it means. And you also know that one centimeter is equivalent to 10 millimeter. So therefore you can multiply and 10 millimeter times 10 millimeter is 100 um, millimeter. So one square centimeter is therefore equal to 100 square millimeters. Express 60 as a product of its prime factors. This should not take you long. You have a calculator, and if your calculator has this fact button there, you say 60. You hit equal to, then you say shift, and then you press the shift. You see that? So you have 2 squared times 3 times 5. Okay, so that's 2 squared times 3 times 5. A school buys packs of pens and packs of rulers. There are 40 or 60 pens in a pack of pens. There are 42 rulers in a pack of rulers. Let me see. Um, they say the school wants to buy exactly the same number of pens and rulers. Um, 42 is nothing but, if I have to write it in, uh, in, in prime factor form, 42 will be 2 times 3 times 7. 2 times 3 times 7. And the reason I am working that out is because I need to find the lowest common multiple of 42 and of 60. And the way you find the lowest common multiple, because you're looking for a big number multiple, you're going to pick between the two the ones with the highest power. Then that comes 3, and that one is a 5, so you write it down, and this one has a 7, so you write it down. So we need them to, to work it out. Okay. So we're going to have. 2 squared is 4 times 3 times 5 times 7. Good. So I have got 420. So 420 is where 60 as well as 42 goes into. So let's see. If we want to find the pack of pens, the pack of pens, we're going to say 420 divided by 60. Okay. Just correct that nicely. So divided by 60. If we want to find the rulers, we're going to take the same 420 and we're going to divide it by 42. Okay, 
The second one can be calculated. You don't need a calculator to know that if you divide 420 by 42, that gives you 10. And when you do the next one on top, 420, the answer divided by 60, that gives you 7. All right. The next question, y is directly proportional to x. So y is directly proportional to x. So this is direct proportion. So y equals to k times the square of x. The square of x, kx square. So when y is 8, then x is 4. Okay, And 4 squared is 16. So this is 8k equals to 16. Um, let us just correct that a bit. Let's rewrite it the same way it is. So this is 8 equals to 16k. That gives me that k equals to 8 over 16. So k is equal to a half. So my equation is y is equal to a half of x squared. So this is my equation right now. So when they say find y when x is 3, so we're going to say y equals to a half of 3 squared. Okay, so you can go ahead and you say a half times 3 squared. Well, that gives you 9 point, nine, and over, 9 over 2, which is the same as 4.5. Right, so y is 4.5. During one year, the mass of a child increased from 25 to 30 kilograms. So it uh, increased by 5 kilograms. Calculate the percentage increase. So the percentage increase is going to be that increase over what it was before. And then you simply multiply that by 100. Okay. So this answer therefore becomes 20%. Factorize. So if you take this two, what is common is B, then A plus two is the same bracket you should get here. And what is common here is plus three. Right, so what you are now writing in order for you to factorize, you're gonna have the bracket A plus two, and then the other bracket B plus three on its own. When you do part B, you should realize that this is the difference of two squares. 5 squared x squared minus 3 squared y squared. So that gives you 5x minus 3y in one bracket and 5x plus 3y in the other bracket. Okay. Right. What you have now is a quadratic trinomial. So you know looking for two numbers multiply give you 24 and if you add them give you 10 and those numbers are nothing but 6 and 4 okay so these are the numbers and when you factorize it it's x plus 6 x plus 4 it doesn't matter which how the order is that you write it which one which bracket you write first it's still it's still valid Question 18 deals with functions. So f of negative 6, you have to calculate. When everywhere we have an x, you substitute that x value with a negative um, 6. So in this particular case, you say f of negative 6 would be 3, and then you have negative 6 plus 4. So that's 5 minus 2. So the answer is minus 3 halves or minus 1.5. Now you need to find the inverse. So the inverse, you say y equals to 3 over x plus 4. And you cross multiply, you have y, and then you have x plus 4. Or before, maybe you do that. Now you're going to swap around. You can swap this around. This becomes x. That is 3 over y plus 4. So the objective is to make y the subject of the formula. So you cross multiply, sort of. Okay. And uh, you're going to get to say y plus 4 equals to 3 over x, and therefore you can say 3 over x take away 4. Of course, um, if you work it out and set, say you arrived at something like so, your answer is still going to be acceptable. So if you say 3 minus 4x all over x, these two are exactly 
the same. Right, so what we need here is we need to calculate in standard form. So I'll grab my calculator. So I'm going to say, all right, um, so I'm going to say the mode. Um, well, let's say we look for the setup. And I'm going to choose, you don't have to do this though, but I'm just going to choose 7 for scientific notation. And this is my rounding. Let's say I must give everything to three significant figures. So I'm going to take 4. So I'm going to put it in bracket 4, times 10 raised to the power of 5. Okay. And then I square that whole thing. So it's going to, let's go back, 4 times 10 raised to the power of 4. Well, if you square that, perhaps um, the calculator is a bit too slow. So I'm going to get rid of that bracket. I'm just going to multiply the whole thing by itself again um, to the power of 5. Let's see. Well, it's a horrible number because uh, you are supposed to square that value, right? Anyway, um, since the calculator is a bit too much for the calculator, so let's just have the setup correctly again. Um, let's go to normal and choose two. Right, so in essence, if I have to write it out, it means that four times 10 raised to the power of five should multiply by 4 times 10 raised to the power of 5. Now, 4 times 4 is 16, okay? And if you say times 10 raised to the power of 5, then it will be 10 raised to the power of 10 because you are now multiplying. So, basically, if, if you look at what I have there, I have a number like 4 times 10 raised to the power of 5, that number, um, maybe it's, uh, see, why is it that the calculator refuses to give me that value? So let's say 4 times, and I'm going to have 10 raised to the power of 5. Well, so that's 400,000. So basically, this here is 400,000 times 400,000. Okay, so if you multiply that times 400,000, you get 1.6 times 10 raised to the power of 11. And now it gives me the answer in standard form. All right, so it's 1.6 times 10 raised to the power of 11. So here you had to reduce this and then you must add 1 in order for you to write it in standard form. B, we have got 1 over. 400,000, the answer should be in standard form. So we can go ahead and say 1 over 400,000, and you can write that in standard form. And obviously, it's going to be 2.5 times 10. Now, this is going to be a negative value. So if you move from there, it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so negative 6. Okay. Um, of course, you can go ahead and it will give you the answer in standard form, if you so wish. It's 2.5 times 10 raised to the power of negative 6. Good. That brings me to question 20. Simplify. So you have got 27 raised to the power. So the moment you see this negative, the moment you see this negative, you will have to take your base and you must invert your base. So, this now becomes x to the power 6 upon 27, which is now raised to a positive power. All right, so x to the power 6, you are going to multiply that or raise that to the power of a half, as well as uh, 27 cubed, you're going to raise that also to power of a third, not a half, but power of a third. So, I'm just going to put, because um, I already started off like that, so I'm going to say 27, um, or let's just rather stick to, to the same script, 
and we're gonna have um, I remove that so I'm gonna have three cubed and uh, once you do that you have x raised to the power of six that's gonna be multiplied by a third over three raised to the power of three that's also gonna be multiplied over a third all right so you're gonna have as a final answer x squared over three right question 10 question 10 say a boat travels from p to q uh, at q it turns 90 degrees as you can see then it travels to r as shown in the diagram okay then if it then returns from r back to q and then back to q to p following the same route in reverse like it went pq is equal to 6 and QR is also equal to 9 kilometers as you can see. The first part of the journey from P to Q to R takes 3 hours, so the first part takes 3 hours. Then the return part from R to Q to P takes 2 hours. So all in all, if you have to find the average speed, to calculate the average speed, you're going to say the average speed is the total distance so that distance will be twice when it goes from six to nine kilometer and back and then you're going to add the time which was three hours plus two hours respectively so that is 30 over five which gives you six kilometers per hour that's how you find the average so you have to take six plus nine again nine plus six that gives you 30 and then the total time because it took him Three hours to go from P to Q to R, and then to return, he went a bit uh, faster, uh, to R to Q, and then Q to P took him two hours. Good. The bearing from of Q from P, so the bearing of Q from P is 40 degrees, as you can see. Calculate the bearing of R from Q. So we have to go to Q. So what I will do is... Uh, I'm going to draw myself um, in offline, okay? And I can actually play around with the information that I have. Right, what do I know? I know that these two angles, this 40 degrees here and this one here, they are co-interior, and co-interior angles, they are up to 180. Right, so another thing, if you look at this 140, Plus this little 40 here should give you a straight line over there. Okay. And that actually makes my rule a bit easier. Again, if you look at this 140, plus this 40 here should also give you a straight angle over there. Right. So I can actually calculate this missing one here. And you can calculate that missing one there by saying, wait a minute. Um, let me just get my calculator right mode. So you can say 180 minus 90 minus 40. So this here is 50. All in all, all of these things should give you 360. Now, what is it that the question asks me to calculate? The question wants me to find the bearing of R from Q. So we go to Q. Okay. And then the bearing of R from Q is this 40 plus this 90 degrees over there. All right, so that will be the 40 degrees plus the 90 degrees. So that gives me 130 degrees. So again, just make sure it's a three figure bearing and then you don't have any problem. Calculate the bearing of P from Q. So bearing of P, but from Q, P from Q, so you go to Q. And you always go in a clockwise direction. So what they are looking for, in essence, the bearing of P from Q, they are looking for this whole angle, and I'll do it in. They're looking for this whole angle all the way from there, all the way up to there. So you see that 180 plus 40, which is uh, 220 degrees. So that will be 180 plus 40. Of course, you can find it using a different method as long as you get to the same answer. Question 22, four interior angles of a hexagon are given as 
100, 110, 120, 140 respectively. The other two are equal. So um, let's go ahead and add these angles. So these are 100 plus 110 plus 120 plus 140. So this gives me 2470 plus 2x, where 2x are representing the two that are equal. Now, here's something that you need to know. The interior angle of a hexagon, okay, is equal to 720 degrees. Now, we are supposed to calculate, so you say 720, take away 470, and in order for you to find, you say 720, take away 470, and then you divide that answer by 2. Good. So 720, take away 470, and you divide the answer by 2. That gives you 125 degrees. That will be one specific angle. Question 23, you have got uh, three lines that are given there. Okay. You have got this line here. I can perhaps write this line down. This is x equals to 2. This line here will, the gradient, first of all, of that line, so the gradient of that line is going to be 6 over 7. So that will be 6 over 7. So that will be y equals 6 over 7x. And it cuts the y-intercept at 6, so that will be plus 6. Okay? So if I have to go and write, and write this, it's going to be 7y. Um, in fact, um, let me just go ahead and see. So that's 7y equals to 6x plus 42. So where do I get 42? So I'm multiplying here by 7. I'm multiplying this term by 7 and also that term by 7. Okay. In this case, the 7s, they will cancel. Right. Um, if you look nicely, um, they want me to, well, if I was to, I'll just leave it like that, all right, um, for that line. Through B and C, I, I get that they are saying 6x plus 7y is equal to 42. Um, so let me see again. Oh, yeah, there's something interesting that I forgot. The gradient here should be a negative value, all right? should be a negative value because you can see the line is sloping in a downwards direction. So at the end of the day, this is going to be 6x plus 7y is equal to 42. So that's just the equation of the lines that I'm doing. Like I did the equation of this line, for example. Well, uh, this one here is not so um, straightforward because there's quite some things you need to do. But they say that the line through A and B is y equals to x over 5. So this one here is y equals to, I'm going to write it, 1 over 5x. All right, so I have got my three equations. Right, now, if they want me to, the region inside of a triangle is defined by three inequalities. Can you see that the line AB is a solid line? So this does not now really say that the inequality uh, they should have put or equal to zero here if that was the case. So you can go ahead and then refer to the line, the region inside for with respect to this line as x is greater than two. All right. So um, this one becomes then um, x is greater than two, or x is greater than or equal to two because it's a solid line as you can see. The other one will be the same. It will be six x plus seven y. So the region. The region is below the required region. This region here, I'm going to show you this region. This required region where these things are defined, this region is below that line CB. And because it's below, the inequality has to be less than. Okay? So you can say it's less than. I'm just going to say less than 42. I'll also accept for the very purpose of this for someone who said 6x plus 7y is less than or equal to 42 uh, because the lines are solid lines. But I'm just keeping to what I have over here and I'm not going to make um, the lines or equal to. 
But either way, it doesn't really matter for now. The line y equals to kx, it passes through triangle ABC. Find uh, all the possible integer values of k. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to find um, we need to find the gradient of O to A and the gradient of X. No, not the gradient of X, but the gradient of OA as well as the gradient of, let's say, OC. Okay, let's go back to what I mean by that. So the gradient of O to A and the gradient of O to C. Once we can find those gradients, we can actually determine what it will be. So the gradient of O to A, um, remember the point that it meets here, this is the point 2. This line here is the line um, y equals to 1 over 5x. So the gradient of line OA is 0 0.2. You got it? So the gradient of line OA, the gradient of line OA, I'm just going to write it in with a, a different pen. So the gradient of this line is 0 0.2 or 1 over 5. I just like to work with that. Okay, now let us look at uh, point C. So we are now looking for the gradient of OC. What is going to be the point here at OC? So we have to find the gradient of O all the way up to C. Right. So we now know that um, that point here is going to be the point um, 2 comma. Now we need to know what that respective Y value would be. Right, so um, we have the gradient uh, of 0 0.2. So let me just come back there. So that's the gradient of OA. So we need to then calculate what is the gradient of OC going to be. So the point OC, the point OC is 2, as, as you can see right here. So this is my point 2 because it's this value here. Now, the y value, we can find the y value by substituting in this equation in the line um, 6x plus 7y equals to 42. I want to find that value there. So, 6 times 2 for x plus 7y equals 42. So, that's 12 plus 7y equals 42. So, 7y equals to 30 and y equals to um, 4 and two sevens. So this is four and two over seven. So if you were to find the gradient of OC, remember you have got two points. You have the point um, zero comma zero. You have the point C, which is the point two comma four and two over seven. So the gradient of this is you take the vertical distance divided by that. So um, it's going to be four and two over seven over 2 because you're just going to uh, subtract 0 from them. So the gradient, therefore, of that line will be um, 4 and let's say 2 over 7. And let's divide that by 2. So it's 2 point something. So it's 2 point, um, okay, so it's 2 point 1 over 2 and 1 over 7. So the gradient is going to be 2. I'm going to leave it as 2.14. Two. So the gradient here of OC would roughly be um, the gradient of OC would roughly be 2.1427. If if I, I remember well, let's grab the calculator just to make sure our value 1428. 1428. Okay, anyway. Uh, up to there should be more or less. So that's the gradient of OC. So what we are actually looking for is from this until there, we're looking for an integer value of K. All right. So 
that value of k should be a number so between 0 0.2 um, so it's 0 0.2 until um, the gradient that we just calculated there which was a uh, 2,1 um, as a 2 comma 1 or 2 and so on so if you have to list the values of k uh, you have got 0 you have got 1 let me just list a few integers 1 2 uh, 3 and let's say up to 4 so we know that it can be 0 okay it can be 0 because it should be bigger than that it can be 3 can be 4 because you can see it's, it's supposed to be um, bigger than 2.14 less than that so the only integer values that stand out is 1 and 2 these are the only integer values for k it's a bit it's a bit um, out there that question you have to spend some time on it in order to understand it um, 100 percent right we have got question 24 is speed time graph so the train slows down uniformly from a speed of 44 meters per second to a speed of 20 meters per second in a time of 10 seconds and uh, they want us to find the deceleration at time t equals to 10. okay in order to find that deceleration so we know that it goes from 44 to 20 right and we are then going to divide it by 10. Okay, the deceleration is going to be that vertical distance. The deceleration is this vertical distance that we have over here. And we are going to divide it with that. All right. And once you calculate, then you have, um, let's get a calculator. So we have 44 minus 20. 44 minus 20 and we divide that answer by 10 so our answer would be 2.4 okay 2.4 meters per second then find the speed at t equals to 5 um, so the speed so let me just go back to my diagram. Um, let's see the T is going to be five will be here. Okay. So the deceleration there, well, either way, even if you decide to check that distance there, you're calculating the gradient and that gradient is the vertical distance divided by horizontal distance. So it's the same when you use the five or if you now had to calculate what this uh, particular distance would be so say for example uh, you didn't want to use you didn't want to use the 10 but you want to use the 5 all right so this is going to be halfway between 44 and 20 so in order for me to find what that distance would be it would be 44 plus 20 and i divide that answer by 2 so again so 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 this is going to be this is going to be 32 meters per second that's 5 so if you had to say 32 over 5 Okay, in order for you to find the deceleration, you say 32 divided by 5, you get the same, no? so 32 divided by 5. As you see, vertical distance, um, because that's 5, so let's suppose um, that's going to be, mm -hmm. okay, we have to use our 10 in order to find our 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 deceleration over there okay um right uh let me just correct this little i had to take a little bit of a right so w what we are doing here in this particular case we find the deceleration so basically you are finding the gradient of that line so it has to be that vertical distance divided by the horizontal distance so it's still this 24 that you find here divided by 10 okay so uh, that's the deceleration. The speed when t equals to 5, in order for you to find the speed, and that's the 32 that I was working up uh, towards um, in my first part there. So the speed there would be 44 
we add 20 and you divide by 2 and you get 32 meters per second that is the speed at that buzzing coin then the distance traveled from t equals 0 to t equals to 10 is equal to the distance traveled from t equals to 10 to t equals to k so if you look at what we have we have got um, the 44 and the 20 divided by 2 times 10 um, gives you 320. So what I'm looking for is um, the area under the graph. So when you look at this whole distance, and I'm going to perhaps just highlight it so you can see that this is actually a trapezium. You don't have to use the formula for the trapezium. So if I have um, this distance over here, this whole thing is a trapezium. So if I want to find the area of that, the area of that is 20 plus 44, which is that distance that I have over there. Okay. So that is like 64. And this distance here is like 10. So times 10 divided by 2. Okay. Um, because we are now looking for that particular value there. So we have 64 times 10. And we divide that answer by 2. So that gives us 320 kilometers. Okay. Uh, or meters. Meters. Right. So why is that information important? Because it says the distance traveled from t to zero, t equals zero here, to t equals to ten, is equal to distance traveled from ten up to here. So this distance, so the area of that trapezium and the area of this rectangle are going to be the same. So when you calculate the area of the rectangle, the area of the rectangle would be 20 over there. So, my goodness. Um, the area of the rectangle was... I'll come back to, to the area of the rectangle would be 20 times, because it's this distance here, 20 times. Now, when you want to find the area of the rectangle, you can go ahead and say, um it is going to be this 10 plus this 10 okay the area of the rectangle 20 times something should give you 320 let's just say uh i take this distance here as an unknown so i'm going to let's say 20 times k uh because this area is 320 i just want to come back to this um trapezium over there so you have got 64 and 20, okay? You are adding the, that's 64, but 44 over there. So let me just get, because remember the area of a trapezium is the sum of the parallel sides times the height over two, okay? So let's just, the height is 20. So if I was to say that is 44, plus this 20, and then this this is 20, right? Can you see uh, that is the the height or the, the other parallel sides? And if I multiply that with 10, 10 being this distance here, which would be like my height of the trapezium, okay? Just to make sure that we get that. Okay, so we have got that 20K, is equal to 320 so we know that the area of this rectangle which we know it's 20 times this whole distance here should give me 320 so i can definitely go ahead and calculate my value of k so k will be 320 divided by 20. so in this case case will k will be 16. okay so i'll say um it's just to bring down everything that I have so far. 
over 2, that allows me to find the 320 kilometers. And therefore, we say for the rectangle, we say 20k equals 320. And then k will be 320. And we divide that by 20. All right. And that is 16. Good. Question 25. We have got a triangle ABC. Uh, they say P and Q are points on AB and AC respectively. And uh, PQ is parallel to BC. You can see that. And then you have got um, AP is 3, PB is 5, and BC is 12. So they want us to say you are supposed to calculate the area uh, of triangle ABC. Um, they say the area of triangle ABC is x centimeters. Okay, if we go here, or first uh, we are supposed to find PQ. So P to Q, you can say, you can look at these two triangles here that are similar, as similar triangles. So you can have one as a small version over there, and then you have one as the big version over there. Okay, so if I was to, to label it, you, you get a, a clear understanding. So that is A, P, Q, and that is A, B, C. The distance um, of A, P, that's three. This distance is going to be three plus five more. So that distance is going to be eight. P, Q is parallel to this one. This one is 12. So what we can do in order to find our value of P, Q, we can say, let P, Q be X. So I'll say, um, PQ and just charge this laptop there we go so I'm going to write it all the way down here so I'm going to say PQ over 12 is equal to 3 over 8. It doesn't matter which one you put on top, okay, as long as you get to the same answer because you are, in fact, busy with um, equivalent fractions, okay? So 3 times 12 divide by 8. So I'm using similarity here, all right? So 3 times 12, you divide that by 8 you get 4.5. All right, so that distance there is 4.5 centimeters. Okay, so let's just go back to our diagram. So this distance here is 4.5 centimeters. Now they say the area of triangle ABC is X, so the area of this whole triangle here is X square centimeter. Find an expression in terms of X for the area of the trapezium. Um, B, C, Q, P. Okay, right. In order for you to find that, let's let's look at what we have. The area of triangle A, P, Q. The area of triangle A, P, Q. So I'm going to have. Uh, I'm I'm going to work with the the distances. Okay. So if k is equal to 3 over 8, okay, the whole one there, and if I square that, so because I am looking for squaring the distances because I'm working with area, dealing with similarity, so I'm going to say 3 over uh, 8. So we're going to have 3 over 8 squared. So that's 9 over 64. Okay, now I have 9 over 64. The moment I see that, and I'm looking for the areas, so I'm going to work with that. So I'm taking the areas of the two triangles, okay? So I'm going to say 9 over 64 is equal to um, a... PQ over X. 
x being obviously um, the big one, right? The area of the big triangle. So I'm, I'm, I'm now working with the areas of the triangle. So if I cross multiply, and I'm going to come back and rewrite that uh, at its correct place. So I have 9 over 64 equals to APQ over X, right? And that allows me to say, okay, cross multiply, that's 9X equals to 64 times APQ, okay? And so the area of APQ, the area of APQ is going to be nothing but um, is nothing but 9x over 64, okay? You see that? Right. So in order for us to find the area of, or to find the value of x, so area of APQ, um, the small one over there, is what I have now, 9x over 64. The area of the big triangle is x, the whole one. So if I want to find the area of the trapezium, I'll have to subtract x minus that 9x over 64. So just have to bear with me and go back and see how I do uh, arrive at the answer. So therefore, the area of the big triangle minus the area of the small triangle, okay? So this is like 1 minus that, or you can say 64 over 64, uh, or in this case, we say 1 minus 9 over 64. I just want to get... It's 55 over 64x because it is given in terms of x. All right, basically, you have to use similarity and then you play around and you also solve that question. Right, I'm just going to take this away to create the space that is required and just rewrite this nicely. So we're going to have um, area of triangle APQ is 9x over 64. And then from there, I went all the way there. Right, so this is 2 raised to the power of x is equal to 2 raised to the power of 10. This 1024, 1024. No need to use, um, to use your logs. If the bases are the same, you drop the bases, then x is equal to 10. Okay, question 27. You have got um, some circle theorems. It says that P, Q, R, and S are points on the circumference, right? And uh, what we need to know is that the center, uh, the angle at the center is twice the angle at the circumference. So the angle P would be 114 divided by 2. So that angle over there is 57, just to bring that in, okay? Uh, and that is what they are asking us here. So we're going to have this whole angle here as SPQ as 57 degrees. Then uh, this angle here, because this is a cyclic quadrilateral, a cyclic quadrilateral, it touches the circumference at four places. That's one, two, three, four. Then what does it mean? It means then that the opposite angles are supplementary. So in order to find angle SRQ, you would be saying uh, 180 degrees minus 57, because these two angles, they should add up to 180. That plus that should be 180. So this is 123. Of course, there is also other ways that you could do that, but this is something that you need to know. So some people will go like, but wait a minute, this angle over here, if you calculate it from 360, is 246. And this angle here would be half of 246 because it's, that's the angle at the center, it's twice the angle at the circumference which is 123, you can just as well do that too. The very last question in the paper is long division for three marks. Find a quotient when 
8x cubed is the plus 10x squared plus 9x minus 8 is divided by 2x minus 1. All right, so I hope you are still familiar with your long division. So we have side work, 8x cubed. We're going to divide it by 2x, so that's going to be 4x squared. So I'm going to have 4x squared over there. And 4x squared times that, that's going to give you 8x cubed. 4x squared times that is going to be minus 4x squared. Okay, so you go ahead and you subtract. Then you have a 10. This becomes a 14x squared because it's 10 minus minus the same as 10 plus. You bring this down, that is 9x. Then you go 14x squared. You divide it again with your 2x, so that is 7x. So on top you'll have 7x. Now go multiply 7x times that is 14x squared. Then you take 7x times negative 1 is minus 7x. Okay, again, we are going to subtract. 9 minus minus 7, that is the same as 16x, and then you bring down this constant value of minus 8. Right. Um, if you go ahead here, and remember this is nothing but my side work, so I'm going to have 16x, and I'm going to divide it by 2. So that's going to give me 8. Can you see that? So that's positive 8. You take that 2x here. So I'm just going to write them nicely. So that 2x goes in this one here, goes in this one here, and it goes in this one here. Okay? So it goes in 16x squared 8 times. Now 8 times 2x, that is 16x. And 8 times negative 1, well, that is negative 8. Right. If you were to subtract, you will get absolutely 0. And you will now realize that the quotient that we are supposed to find is 4x squared plus 7x plus 8. No remainder. Okay, so you get one mark for each term. Okay, so um, good luck with your test tomorrow. Please don't sleep late. Yeah. Be relaxed and focused and rest well so you can write the question papers tomorrow on the 24th of October.